On today's show, a heartbreaking overtime loss against the Chicago Bulls, 124-119. The Rockets managed to hold the Bulls scoreless over the final four minutes of regulation to force overtime, spearheaded by Alper and Shingun and his insane second half comeback, but it wasn't enough to get it done in this game. We're going to break it all down for you coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. Throw it up to Jalen Green. Shingun here in the short row. Oh, my, that's the no look. Jabari for three and the win. Yeah! Look at Tari Eason. Here comes Tari. Oh! T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. The Houston Rockets select Amen Thompson and Cam Whitmore. One thing I have never done is not made the playoffs, and so we want to take that step here as well. Six. Five, four, three, two, one. Pain, pain, pain. It all hurts. God, this game sucked. (laughs) What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked on Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym, after a heartbreaking loss like this one. Thank you for being an everydayer. Thank you for making the show part of your day every single day. Rockets fall to the Bulls 124-119 in overtime. Second game of their six-game road trip. They are now 0-2 on this road trip, back to an even 518-18 on the season. And man, I thought they had this one, guys. I really did. That fourth quarter comeback, spearheaded by Alperin Shingun, who was absolutely dominant in the fourth quarter and overtime after being basically a non-factor through the first three quarters of this game and two and a half quarters. He start he started waking up in the third quarter, but basically a non-factor in the first half. Ime Odoka said as much post game or LP decided to finally show up in the second half and he was dominant and he spearheaded the run offensively for the Rockets and defensively they locked in defensively. It was insane. They held the bulls scoreless for four minutes and 15 seconds, the final 4.15 of regulation, the Bulls were at 112. They were at 112 with four minutes and 15 seconds left to go in this game. And then the Rockets mounted an insane comeback to tie it up over those final four minutes and 15 seconds. Alperin Shingun had the game-tying bucket Javari Smith Jr. had the clamps on DeMar DeRozan late. The defense by Jabari in this game was insane. The defense by the entire team in that final 415 was sensational. Some of the best defense we've seen them play since losing Dylan Brooks and also now no Tari Eason in the lineup. It's really hard for this team to be a top defensive team when you're missing two of your best, your two best defenders. But they got it done. They forced overtime. And in overtime, they jumped ahead. They were up 119, 114. The Bulls had no answer for Alper and Shingun. None. Zero. Zilch. Nada. They couldn't do anything about Alper and Shingun. He was scoring at will. He was getting buckets. He was getting to the free throw line. He wasn't hitting his free throws, which is maddening. Alperin Shingun in this game, he finished with 25 points on 11 of 19 shooting. He was 0 of 3 from three-point land, 3 of 8 at the free throw line, which hurts the three-point shooting and the free throw shooting. He had nine rebounds, five assists, two steals, two turnovers, and 41 minutes of run. He was 0 of 5 in the first half. He... 
showed up in a big way after being a non-factor there in the first half. He showed up and, and, and almost led the Rockets to a win. There's even a clip of him on the sideline when he's talking to his teammates during a timeout, dead ball, whatever. And he's saying, let's get this effing win. Let's get this effing win. And that drive, that look in his eye, that I'm him mentality, that ability to take over a game, not everybody has that. Very few players have that. And to see him go on the run that he did and and dominate this game after, after the non-existent first half that he had, zero points, 0-5 shooting, to show up the way that he did in the second half gets the you know the words of encouragement from Ime Odoka, whatever. That's big time. It is. And unfortunately, due to some late game execution issues that we're going to unpack here in just a second, uh, the Rockets were not able to secure this win after leading by five, being up 119-114 with just over two minutes to go in overtime. The Rockets managed to go scoreless the rest of the way. The Bulls reeled off 10 straight points and the Rockets take the L and it hurts. But I think this game shows a couple things. One, it shows Alper and Shingo really is, he he's that guy, right? When he turns it on, he's almost unstoppable. Two, it showed us that you need to have proper the proper personnel around Alper and Shingun for him to be as effective as he's as he can be normally. And having Jay Sean Tate out there is not it. It clogs up the spacing, it messes things up for the for for the offensive flow of the starters, all of that. More on that a little bit later. Because Cam Whitmore was out there in crunch time. And that was awesome to see. And I think the biggest question mark here is why can't we get this version of Alper and Shingun from the start of a game? And I see a few different theories floating around. I've seen people discussing this. Um, one being that, you know, the team has, you know, as a team kind of uh, decision or as a, as a coaching staff decision, they try to get, you know, Jalen Green, Fred Van Vliet, they try to get their perimeter guys going early on. And so LP is utilized as more of a, a hub, a facilitator, uh, you know, a connective piece rather than a play finisher. So the first couple quarters, Alpi's kind of coasting. He's trying to get other guys involved. Second half comes along, and then he he wakes up and he starts trying to score the ball. But the messaging from Ime post game kind of paints a different picture where he wants Alpi to be aggressive from the jump. So why is it that we can't get the, and this is, this has been a recurring theme. He has highlighted this before this season that LP has this weird ability where sometimes he'll, he'll struggle in the first half or he won't be nearly as aggressive as he was in the, you know, to close out a game and he comes out and he's just kind of, you know, not that he's not trying. It's just that he's not nearly as locked in sometimes. And Again, 0 of 5 shooting. He wasn't really aggressive in the first half. He wasn't playing the way he's, he was a completely different player in the second half. So, what needs to happen for Alper and Shingu to be that player in the first half of this game? Because if Alpi had played like this the entire game, first off, he would have had like a 40 piece. <laughs> but even if he had just had like a normal LP game start to finish rather than turning it on in the fourth quarter and dragging the team to overtime, then the Rockets would have won this game by double digits because they did a good enough job defensively up and down the Bulls' entire lineup to win this game. So what needs to change for LP to be this version of himself from the start of the game rather than turning it on just in the second half? It was impressive as all hell in this game, but it was not enough to get the win unfortunately. Want to unpack some of the mistakes that the Rockets made, their late game execution in this one. The fact that it's it's time, the discussion, it, it, we're, we're well past this being a discussion point. Uh, Cam Whitmore should start as long as Dylan Brooks and Tari Eason are out. He's a better complement for Alper and Shingun. He's a better complement for the other starters. Uh, other thoughts from this game, Jalen Green and Fred Van Vliet, their performances in this one. We're going to unpack all that and so much more coming up here in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. 
PrizePix is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. They're the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports because it's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you just pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Prize picks is so simple to play. You can make your picks and submit an entry in less than 60 seconds. They've got quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types, which is what makes Prize picks the number one DFS app on the market. Prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only DFS platform with an injury insurance insurance policy. So if you've been thinking about getting into daily fantasy sports, you've got to try prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and promo code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks is daily fantasy sports made easy. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, oh man, the execution there in overtime specifically, uh, you know, again, just uh, just to, again, give them a lot of credit, give the Rockets a ton of credit for the defensive performance down the stretch of this game, a ton of credit to Jabari Smith Jr., who was so locked in, had the, you know, put the clamps on DeMar DeRozan, Alper and Shingun, who did a great job of staying vertical, contesting at the rim, playing through having five fouls, um, drawing that one insane offensive foul on uh, Zach Levine as he drove to the rim. That was a big time play. You know, the, the Rockets defense really locked in through those final four minutes of regulation and, and even, you know, into overtime until, uh, until Zach Levine had that driving and one bucket that, you know, arguably could have been a travel. We'll see on the last two minute report, whether it was a travel or not. Um, I think it's one of those bang, bang plays that, you know, the NBA lets a lot of travels go. So maybe that was one of them. Uh, what was a really egregious play was the flop by DeMar DeRozan, uh, on the box out from Jalen green, Jalen gave him like a, the tiniest little elbow and DeMar DeRozan went flying. And that was like, give DeMar DeRozan an Oscar for that performance, man. But look, the Rockets were in a great position to win this game after clawing their way back into it. They were up 119, 114. And then on, they had back to back poor offensive possessions and back to back offensive possessions that didn't end in Shingun attempting a shot. And I think that's a pretty pretty massive mistake with the way that this game was going and how dominant Shingun was. Now, the first of which is kind of on Shingun because Shingun held the ball, he was making his move, and he made a move on Vooch and then kicked the ball back to Cam Whitmore. Now, the problem is Cam Whitmore had an open three. If Cam Whitmore had just pulled the three that he had, it would have been a good, wide-open, clean three-point attempt. Instead, Cam put the ball on the deck and dribbled around Alper and Shingun. And then I believe Kobe White, who was guarding him, went under the LP kind of like, it wasn't like a full-blown screen, but like he went under Shingun and gave Cam Whitmore space. And Cam still didn't pull up for three from that spot at the top of the arc and instead dribbled into uh, a mid-range two with the shot clock winding down. And he wound up missing it. So that's that was a bad offensive possession. You know, and it was bad because Al P spent a little bit too much time, didn't, you know, tried to get to his spin move, got walled off by the defense and had to pitch it back out. And so that was one error. And then Cam messed up by not shooting the op- the two open threes that he had and instead dribbling into a, a long two. That's that's not what you want offensively. And this all this was coming off the heels of Alper and Shingun hitting that insane, like Dirk esque fadeaway where he was bottled up had nowhere to go, did a couple pirouettes, a couple spins, and then had to, you know, launch a, just a moonshot over Vucevic and give the Rockets the 119-114 lead. So then after the cam possession, Zach Levine comes down, he gets his and one bucket. Um, it's 119-117 at this point. And then on the next possession, and this was the one that, that really 
that really, really hurt for a variety of reasons. Um, Jalen Green, you know, runs pick and roll with Alper and Shingo. So first off, Fred gets LP set up. So every possession down, Fred has been getting the ball to LP. He's been running one five pick and roll where Fred sets a screen on LP's defender. They've been spacing him out. They're basically doing like, you know, not quite one four flat with Alper and Shingo where it's like him at the top of the arc and then all the other four guys spaced out. But it's basically that. It's like LP ISO to end the game. And... Fred sets up LP, then then Jalen comes over and LP pitches the ball to Jalen and sets a screen for Jalen and is is waiting for the pocket pass on the roll and doesn't get it. So then he retreats back to the three point line. And Jalen continues his drive to the rim and collapses the defense to where all five defenders are like basically touching the paint as Jalen is jumping and elevating for this layup attempt. And he smokes the layup. He does the hard work. He beats the defender. He gets there. But it's a contested layup over two defenders, one defender, if you just want to count Vucevic. Like, it's not a high percentage shot, especially considering the fact that Jalen struggles at finishing at the rim. Like, that's those are just facts. And then to compound that, Alper and Shingun has been utterly dominant. So any possession that doesn't end with him attempting a shot or at least generating a wide open shot for a teammate seems like a, you know, a misuse of possessions of critical possessions late in the game, late in overtime. And then lastly, and this is the part that really bothers me. He had so many shooters open on that drive. He had Cam Whitmore open in the opposite corner. He had Fred Van Vliet open in the strong side corner. He had Jabari Smith Jr. open on the elbow because all five defenders were so focused on Jalen's drive. He could have kicked it out to any one of them. And what's crazy is Jalen's passing was actually on another level in this game. He had eight assists. His play in the first half of this game, while Shingun was MIA, Fred Van Vliet and Jalen Green held it down. They were, they were making shots. They were scoring the ball. They were doing what they needed to do to try and keep the Rockets afloat while Al P was waiting to show up in the third quarter. And so he had made that exact pass, that exact read, drive and kick to a corner or drive and kick back out to the wing or the opposite corner or whatever. He's, he had made that read a couple different times already in that very game. And then in that moment, he chose to attack and try and score And that's where, like, the basketball IQ's got to be better. You've got to read the room. Like, there was zero reason for Jalen to take that shot. I'm sorry. That's, that's, that was not the play there. You know, if, if the play results the way that the one did before where Alper and Shingun attacks and the defense walls him off and a second defender comes over and it generates an open shot for a teammate and he pitches it back out, fine. You live with that. Cam should have taken the three. But those back-to-back possessions, they didn't fully sink the Rockets, but it, it's they had all the momentum in this game. And then those back-to-back flubbed possessions uh, gave, gave the Bulls life. They gave them a chance. And they came back, and they had the Zach Levine and one. And then uh, I believe it was, what, a Zach Levine three-pointer. Yeah, uh, on the very next possession. And then the Dagger three, the Kobe White three, uh, with just over a minute remaining. Uh, and then it became, you know, free throw battle at that point. Um, it, uh, it sucks because the Rockets should have won this game. And there were a lot of reasons that they didn't win this game. Alper and Shingun didn't show up in the first half. That's inexcusable. That can't happen. You can't have a half where you're basically just a non-factor. Um, and I, there are going to be some, you know, fans who say okay he was defending and he was you know and and he was setting screens and he was doing that sure when you're the best player on the team you know heavy is the head that wears the crown right that's the expression Alper and Shingun is the best player on the team there's a different level of expectations for him and he cannot have a half where he shows up and, and goes 0 of 5 and doesn't score a single point if Luka Doncic shows up and has a half like that guess what the Mavs are down 20 they're getting blown out right if LeBron shows up and has a half like that, guess what? Lakers fans are are, are clamoring for him to, to retire or be traded or, or whatever the hell Lakers fans do because they're insane. This Your star player cannot have a half like that because then it's going to put you behind the eight ball. And that's exactly what happened. The Rockets had to claw their way back into this game. 
And even late, like the, the execution late wasn't great. The shot making at times wasn't great. Alper and Shingun needed to be better with the free throw shooting. And he took that one three in, in OT that I thought was just a, a really poor decision when you've been absolutely feasting and cooking Vucevic by driving and getting downhill against him. Why you would settle for taking a three pointer? I get it. Like it'd be it'd be nice. You sink the three. You're like, yeah, three points, whatever. He's not a good shooter. He's not a good three point shooter. That's a bad shot. So, you know, the LP free throw shooting was bad. The the three point shot was bad. The Jalen layup was bad. The Cam Whitmore relocation to mid range was bad. So much of that was bad. And despite all those little things, like if the Rockets just had one of those things like break their way, one of those shots goes in, whatever, we could be talking about a win right now instead of an overtime loss, a heartbreaking overtime loss because of how hard this team fought to get back into this game. So it sucks, but that's that's where this team is at, right? Is there's They've got to be able to execute. And you're going to see moments like this where they make young kind of mistakes where... Um, I mean, hell, Jalen missed the free throw late in regulation on the and one drive. He had that insane and one drive and then he didn't complete the three point play. That would have been huge. So there was a, there's a lot of different things that you can point to in this game, little instances. Um, but I do not agree. And this is where I want to push back on this loss wasn't square. It wasn't, it wasn't Jalen's fault for the attempted layup. It wasn't Cam Whitmore's fault for the missed midi or the foul on Zach Levine that gave him the and one. It wasn't Shingun's fault for not showing up in the first half. And then the missed free throws late. Like this was a collective team loss because there were so many different things that each person on this roster could have done differently or could have done better that they didn't do to secure this win. And so you take those, you learn from these moments, you grow from them, and that's how you get better as a team. So hopefully the next time the Rockets are in this situation and it's late and they're in an overtime period and Alper and Shagoon's cooking or somebody else is cooking, whoever it may be, it doesn't have to be LP. Could be Jabari, could be Jalen, could be Fred, could be Dylan when he's healthy. Whoever it is, you feed the hot hand, every possession down, and you make sure you get the best possible possessions when you're in the crunch time like that. So coming up, I do want to discuss Cam Whitmore's role in this game. Ime Odoka continuing to give him uh, more and more minutes and the conversation that needs to be had at this point where Cam Whitmore should probably be starting over Jay Sean Tate, uh, in, at least until Dylan Brooks and, and or Atari Eason are healthy and available to start instead uh, as well as I want to, you know, highlight a couple other points from this game. Jabari Smith Jr.'s defense, I think, deserves, uh, his overall game deserves some shine. Uh, we're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Look, I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of real life, but can we talk for just a minute about preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade, which is pretty scary. I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than if a close friend or a loved one got sick while a supply chain issue kept them from life-saving medication that they needed. Thankfully, you can be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, skin infections, among other things. This stuff could happen to any one of us. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medication will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use code Locked On to get $20 off your order. Again, that's jacemedical.com. Offer code locked on to get $20 off of your order. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. All right. I want to, I've highlighted the defense a couple times here, but I wanted to spend a moment to just talk about how impressive Jabari Smith Jr.'s defense really was in this game, um, specifically on DeMar DeRozan, but even on switches, guarding other guys, but primarily DeMar DeRozan holding him to 5 of 19 shooting for the game, getting the stop on him late 
uh, when when the Rockets needed a stop on him late in the game. Uh, Jabari played an insane team high 47 minutes in this game. Uh, this was uh, Jabari continues to he's made defense arguably the best part of his game. The offensive you know steps that he's taken when he does have it going offensively have been nice to see, but even when he doesn't have it going offensively, he gets to stay on the floor now because he's one of the team's best defenders, more most versatile defenders for sure. And he's, he's made rebounding like a focal point of his game. Defense and rebounding are Jabari's calling cards. He walks away from this game with 15 boards, 15 rebounds for Jabari Smith Jr. in this game. He was a monster on the glass. He was great playing defense. And on top of that, he had 18 points. He knocked down his shots. He was 7 of 14 shooting, 4 of 9 from three-point land. Yeah, he missed the the would-be, you know, game winner. But, I mean, this was an incredible performance from Jabari. And this is the type of, like, kind of uh, performance that I've, I've become to, I've kind of come to expect from Jabari Smith Jr., right? Where he plays above average defense, he's switchable, he can guard a variety of guys, or when when you need to, you put him on the opposing team's best player, right? They put him on DeMar DeRozan down the stretch. That is a huge, like, sign of respect from the Rockets coaching staff that instead of, you know, oh, hey, we're gonna we're gonna throw Jay Sean Tate out there and we need Jay Sean Tate to go out there and lock up, you know, DeMar DeRozan on the final possession. No, they, they gave it to Jabari. They said, no, Jabari, that's your guy. Go get him. Go lock him down. And he did. He, he was disciplined. The number of times that DeMar DeRozan tried to get to his little, like, you know, drive, go middle, snatch back, dribble, pump fake, and then like up and under move that he does. Cause that's like DeMar's like thing, right? That's his go-to move is he gets right to the free throw line and he'll hit you with a bunch of fakes and jabs. And, and suddenly like you, you, you bite on one of them. And the moment you bite on one of them, DeMar gets wide open. You know, he's either fading away or an up and under towards the rim, whatever. Watching Jabari be disciplined on so many of those DeMar DeRozan drives, including that final possession where they needed the stop uh, was that that shows a lot of growth, right? That shows a lot of defensive game plan discipline. Uh, he knew exactly how he needed to guard DeMar DeRozan and did a fantastic job of it in this game. So I wanted to give Jabari a ton of credit for that. Just he was, I think you can make the argument, even though Shingun was incredibly dominant. I th- well, I think you still got to give locked on Rockets player of the game to Shingun, but Jabari was consistent the whole game, right? Jabari was the one player who showed up for all four quarters and OT of this game. He was himself the whole way through. Shingun had the, you know, the disappearing act in the first half. Jalen and Fred tried to hold it down in the first half while Shingun struggled. And then, you know, they, they kind of struggled a little bit late uh, in the second half. So it, it is what it is. But I wanted to give Jabari Smith Jr. his flowers, though. Oh, sorry. I don't know what this is. Upper respiratory infection or what? But I've, I've been, like, congested for, like, going on a week now. It's been awful. Oh, okay. The... Not quite the elephant in the room. Is it the elephant in the room? It's not really an elephant in the room. Uh, the Rockets are still hurt. They're still injured. They're missing Dylan Brooks. They're missing Tari Eason. It doesn't look like either of those two guys are going to be coming back anytime soon. It seems like the Rockets plan to hold Tari Eason out, at least per Emo Doka before the Chicago Bulls game. It seems like the plan is to hold Tari Eason out for an extended period of time until that leg is better and then to do a better job maintaining him as the season moves on. So it seems like we could be missing Tari and Dylan for a, a, a much longer period of time than originally thought. So that being said, the Rockets need to figure, they need, they need answers with their lineup because right now, Jay Sean Tate, starting at the three is not the answer. It, it's hurting a lot of things with this lineup. Um, it, and this is not a, this is not a knock on Jay Sean Tate, the player, because I, I still very much believe, and this is where, you know, a lot of Rockets fans and myself differ. Jay Sean Tate can be really effective for 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes a night, depending on matchups, depending on what you need out of a certain, you know, on a certain possession or out of certain lineups, his spark, his hustle, his intensity off the bench is almost unmatched and you need guys like that. You need guys who can come in and be difference makers off the bench. The problem is his skill set does not complement the rest of the starters. In fact, it actively sabotages the rest of the starters because the way that this team is the most effective is when they're running heavy pick and roll with Fred Van Vliet and Alper and Shingun or Jalen Green and Alper and Shingun or just running the offense straight up through Alper and Shingun, right? So, 
in order to do that, you need proper spacing. Now, I argued before, and I've argued this before, and I still believe this, you can have two non-shooters on the floor and make it work, it's just a lot harder because then you really have to be on top of moving without the basketball, cutting, set, having off-ball actions to free up other guys. You have to do all these little things to open up the offense if you have two non-shooters on the floor. The Rockets to this point this season offensively have not expanded the playbook enough to where they have all these, you know, beautiful off ball actions and ways that they can open guys up when there are non shooters on the court. So what happens is you have Jay Sean Tate who primarily will sit in the corner offensively and his defender likes to cheat in off of him constantly. Defenses don't care if Jayshon Tate takes three point shots from anywhere on the floor. They don't. His defender basically gets to play free safety. On, on the defensive side of the ball. And that clogs up the paint for Alper and Shingoon. It allows for quicker double teams. It messes up driving lanes for Jalen Green and Fred Van Vliet. And that's just, that's just the reality of the situation, right? You can get away with that when you have the second unit in there, when you've got five out spacing, and when Jay Sean Tate is one of your only non-shooters on the quarter. Even if you've got Jay Sean Tate and Amin Thompson out there, you've still got five guys all on the perimeter. You don't have somebody who's trying to take advantage of their post-up game on the interior like an Alper and Shingoon when you're playing five out with the second unit. So I say all that to, to say that Right now, the obvious answer is Cam Whitmore should be the starting three for this team until Dylan Brooks and Tari Eason, one of them, are healthy and available to come back and take that starting spot instead. Because it feels like Jay Sean Tate's role is much more effective when he's coming off the bench. He doesn't compliment the starters as much. And Cam Whitmore does. His skill set does complement the starters because he's very much he's very able to just stay in his lane offensively. He's a spot up three point threat. He'll let it fly the moment he touches the ball. That's exactly what you need out of that position. Now, there are still some growing pains that are going to be had with Cam Whitmore, right? There's some decision making issues. Uh, I don't want to call Cam a black hole offensively because that seems a little harsh, but there is a tendency where Cam touches the ball. That thing's probably going to fly like he's probably going to shoot it. Um, and that's okay. He's, he's out there to be a scorer. He's out there to put the ball in the bucket in this game against the Bulls. He had 16 points on six of 12 shooting. He was two of five from deep hit his two free throws. Great game from camp. He even, he even made some defensive plays in this game, had a couple steals, right? He had an assist in there. He had some good rebounds. Cam can give you what you need out of that three spot. Your defense may take a slight step back with Cam Whitmore in the starting lineup, but I think your offense is going to is gonna step up to another level when you have that amount of spacing and you're able to open the floor for guys like Shingoon, Fred, Jalen, all of that. Um, I think the benefits far outweigh the negatives. And again, if you are getting torched, if Cam is getting targeted defensively, whatever, one, part of it for Cam is, is less about like, you know, his ability to play like on-ball defense. It's more just his awareness at times, uh, you know, when he's playing off ball defensively and he's only going to get better at those, the more reps that he actually gets. But if you are getting absolutely cooked defensively, or if ha having Cam Whitmore out there hurts you too much, just do a quick substitution, right? Start the game for the first three or four minutes. And if you need to make a quick adjustment, cool. That's when you throw, throw Jay Sean Tate out there, right? Plug him in, throw in Aaron holiday for Jalen green. And then suddenly, or throw an Aaron holiday for Cam Whitmore. And then suddenly you've got Aaron holiday to be your, I can't call him your ace perimeter defender, but, you know, to up the ante defensively a little bit, right? There's options. Ime has options here. I just don't know if, he, I want to see if he's got the stones to put Jay Sean Tate back on the bench and put Cam Whitmore in the starting lineup because there's a reason he ran with Cam Whitmore all the way through the fourth quarter and into OT in this game. He was a better, more complimentary piece for that lineup. In fact, in the fourth quarter of this game, the Rockets lineup that featured Fred, Jalen, Al P, Jabari, and Cam was a plus 16 when they went on their insane run to tie things up and force overtime. They were a plus 16 in their minutes. For the entire game, they finished the game a plus seven. For the entire for the for the full game, that lineup, Fred, Jalen, Al P, Jabari, and Cam played 15 and a half minutes in this game, and they were a plus seven. 31 possessions. And they were a plus seven in those minutes. That's how, that lineup sounds like a recipe for success. 
And the fact that Cam continues to carve out a spot for himself in this Rockets rotation, again, I said it when Dylan first went down, maybe the silver lining is here, here is that Cam, you know, earns some minutes and earns the trust of Ime Udoka. And that's exactly what it looks like is happening. At this point, though, he probably deserves an even bigger role. Not necessarily just because he's been playing out of his mind, which he has been. His skill set is just more complimentary of the starters. So I hope to see Ime make the change. And again, this isn't a knock on Jay Sean Tate, who I still, still think is very much a winning player and a guy that can be an important winning piece of this Rockets basketball team. It's just, it makes more sense right now with the lineup that they have and with the roster that they have available. So I want to see Ime make that change. Uh, will he make that change though? Will the Rockets learn from some of the mistakes that they had in this game? I don't know. I hope so because this, I hope to not have another heartbreaking loss like this one. They are now 0-3 in overtimes this season. So Rockets got to figure out what's going on with overtimes because they have not been able to uh, close things out. But I do want your thoughts from this game. Let me know how you felt about this one. Give me your your emotions from this loss. Give me your thoughts on Alper and Shingun's dominant uh, fourth quarter and overtime performance. Uh, your thoughts on some of the execution late in this game. Should Cam Whitmore start over Jay Sean Tate? Let me know all your thoughts in the YouTube comments. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. <laughs>